Good morning and welcome to Coffee with Rich. Sorry, we're running a little late. We had some technical difficulties here on our end, but no problem. We got it all taken care of now. I know that a couple of you out there on the West Coast are waiting. Uh, I've got your messages and here we are. Uh, let's see here. I am live. I just got another question from some of our friends in New Mexico. We are up and running, folks. Sorry about the delay. Some technical difficulties, and those do happen. Um, good morning, Dr. Wells. How are you this morning, sir? Good morning. I am fine. Good. Glad to have you. Here in just a second, I'm going to um, ask Dr. Wells to introduce himself to the audience. Uh, let's see who's on so far. Let me get uh, set up here, as always. Let's see. Okay, looks like we are set up. Let's see, Paul is on this morning. Will Parker at Montana is on. Good morning, Will. Gerald in Oregon, coin number 952. And if you're wondering what a coin number is, check out American warrior society for that good morning paul my lovely bride miss lisa is on good morning ma'am dr john adine is on out there in san antonio good morning sir gene is on angel is on out in new mexico good morning angel good to see you brett in california uh very excited to have you We've got 23 folks joining us live please like and share before we get started We've got a great show for you this morning if you don't know i am rich brown the co-host and co-founder of the American Warrior Show and the American Warrior Society, America's number one self-defense podcast. And this morning, we have with us Dr. Stuart Wells. Good morning once again, Dr. Wells. Good morning. Uh, if you would, sir, tell us a little bit. Uh, tell us a little bit about yourself and your background, please. Okay. Well, uh, I grew up in Southern Arkansas. Uh, got educated in Louisiana, moved to Tennessee, and I'm teaching, starting my 33rd year teaching at Tennessee Tech University here in Cookville. Uh, I have a rural background, uh, grew up hunting and fishing, shooting, things like that. Uh, got a real strong belief in personal responsibility. Uh Big believer in the Second Amendment. I think it protects all the others. I'm giving you all some random things so you just kind of get a good idea of what I'm about. Uh, pretty pretty simple. Uh, plain talk's easy to understand, and which sometimes means you're about to hear something you're not going to like. But in this case, let's hope not anyway. But I do uh, also teach digital forensics and have a digital forensics company. And that's one of the things we've gotten a, a lot of talk about here lately. Yes, sir. I'm sure. Uh, now, where did you where did you go to university? Well, I went to a little college called Southern State College. It's now Southern Arkansas University, Magnolia, Arkansas. Got my undergraduate. Then I went to Louisiana Tech, got my MBA, uh, worked for a few years, started a company, ran it, decided my real what I really wanted to do was I wanted to teach at the college level. So I went back to Louisiana, sold my company, went back to Louisiana Tech and got my doctorate there. Uh, I was teaching at LSU Shreveport at the time. Then I moved up here to stay a, a year or two, and that was in fall of 88. And I still have no plan. I've started my 33rd year and have no plans of <laughs> retiring. Well, I tell you, it's a beautiful college. You know, both of um, uh, my daughter and son graduated from there. And my son, as you know, is working on his graduate degree at uh, yes. Tennessee Tech. Beautiful university. We're uh, it's a family tradition at this point. Uh, Dr. Wells, I understand that you you hunt and do a little shooting. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, I, I don't know that you'd call me your premier big game hunter, but I love to hunt hogs. That, mm -hmm. That's my favorite. I hunt hogs, and you can tell how cultured I am here. My favorite things to hunt are hogs, coyotes, and rats. Now, <laughs> rats don't sound like anything a lot of fun, but if you'll take your little twenty two with a silencer on it and night vision, it is a target rich environment. Uh, now that's not, that actually does sound pretty fun. <laughs> if I'm you sure. want just them for fun, then I like to hunt hogs a lot and also yeah. reload and all the other standard vices. All right. Well, I think a lot of our uh, viewers will appreciate that. Got 38 folks viewing us live this early Friday morning. Uh, good morning, William Littrell. Good to see you. 
Good morning. Uh, Donald Dallas is on from Bell Buckle, Tennessee, coin number 1885. And once again, if you want to find out more about how you can become a coin member of the American Warrior Society, please check out AmericanWarriorSociety.com, which is today's sponsor of the show. Ruben, good morning, sir. Says, I get to train with your best friend. I wonder who that is. I'm very excited for you there, brother. That's awesome. Robert is on this morning from Kentucky. John is on from Oklahoma. Wade is on. Good morning, he says, and good morning, Wade, to you. Tiny is on in Georgia. Kat, good morning and glad to have you from Santa Fe. Jared says, good morning, all. And Jared, of course, is in the beautiful state of Montana. I was just out there. And a matter of fact, this morning, Dr. Wells, I'm drinking. I know that you're drinking coffee this morning. I'm drinking from oh, my yeah. Glacier uh, National, National Park mug. Hmm. Okay, let's get into it, uh, Dr. Wells. So you hunt hogs. That sounds awesome. I'm going to talk to you about that offline because I would love to get into some of that here in Tennessee. I wanted to talk to you about, you mentioned, it, you mentioned digital forensics. What is forensics, Dr. Wells? Well, if you look up forensics in the dictionary, it has a lot of different definitions. The way we mean it here is doing things in a specified manner such that they are forensically sound and admissible in court. Uh, you can have all the best evidence in the world, but if you didn't obtain it correctly using the proper equipment, software, and procedures, it won't be admissible in court and be absolutely useless for you. So uh, that's pretty much us. We're going out and we're looking for computer forensics. Is very much like if any of you have ever watched the old episodes of CSI, Forensic Files. Sometimes they're looking for digital forensics, but more often they're looking for uh, other types of trace evidence. Fibers, the trilobal fiber that comes from your, your carpet in your car, blood, anything like that. But we're looking for trace evidence too, except it's in a digital form. And uh, we typically get it off uh, the hard drives, but we can also get uh, get it from memory and from solid state drives. And it used to be called computer forensics. We now call it digital forensics because I've done forensics on everything from hard drives to cameras. And uh, if it's digital, we can pretty well recover it. And we have to recover it where we don't change it in the process. And that's one of the biggest things that differentiates data recovery from forensics. Yeah, I tell you, and, and this is a huge, I think we talked about yesterday during the pre-show, Dr. Wells, uh, as a Marine Corps investigator, I had, um, I flew into Puerto Rico one time and uh, the, the, the suspect, you know, I went into his office and uh, he had his hands on the keyboard and I'm like, lift your hands and get up, you know. Yes. Put your cell phone on the desk, don't touch anything, closed it all up, bagged it all up and... Uh, after interrogating him for a while, I got back in the plane and came back to the States to turn it over to somebody like you, sir, to do the <laughs> forensics investigation. Cause that was outside of my uh, lane. But uh, Tony says, have you looked into the Clinton's emails? Don't take this out of context, but I believe 100% had we been allowed to do that investigation, we would have know everything that happened. Emails don't just go away. You don't just delete them. Uh, I mean, you can delete them, but all that really does is moves them to your uh, uh, recovery box. Uh, God, just forget the word, but your, your trash can, depending mm -hmm. on what kind of computer you have. And it's just another area where it saves those things. And they're not really gone. In fact, uh, they go through several steps before, let's take a Windows system, because each one works a little differently, but Windows being the predominant system that I work with, uh, the information's still out there. And a lot of people think they can reformat their hard drives after they've deleted it and get rid of everything. Not so, because you can, reformatting a hard drive is like going through a building, jerking all the door numbers off and putting new door numbers back up. The rooms are still there. All the material's still there. All the people are still there. You just got to have a different way of getting to it. And forensics gives us another way to get to it. But I firmly believe we would know what every one of those emails were. Because it's it was on a hard drive, not a solid state drive also, which makes a difference. Is Which one is harder for you, sir, the solid state or the 
the solid state is more difficult for all of us in forensics because the typical hard drive left everything out there until it needed to use that space and then would rewrite over it. Well, solid state drives are more like the old Etch-A-Sketch. Remember the one that, that you had the two little knobs? Mm -hmm. Well, you always had to shake it first. And that's what you have to do. You have to clean each one of these little clusters of data uh, spaces where you're going to store data before you can write on it. So SSDs do two functions. They do one called trim and one called garbage collection. The trim identifies which of these little groups of data are ready for reuse and goes ahead and blanks them out. When that happens, we lose the data that was there. Whereas on the hard drive, it would still be there till it was physically rewritten. Well, I wanted to, I want to talk to that real quick. Um, the only, there's only one case I worked where we could not get into this guy's computer. And uh, when we, when I turned it over as evidence, I was told that uh, all the computers with, a, there was a ring of crooked Marines down in Florida and I seized all their stuff. And one guy, uh, somebody leaked that I was coming down to do the investigation and he forensically cleansed his hard drive, whatever that means, because we spent months, I say we, whoever it was that went up to headquarters Marine Corps spent months trying to recover the information. And they said, we can see the icons, but we can't see any data beyond that. So I don't know what he used there, uh, Dr. Wells. Do you have any idea about products like that? The, a generic name for the product is, and it, there is, I think there is a product out there, but this name's called Wipe Drive. Wipe Drive, C Cleaner, uh, Evidence Eliminator. That one's kind of an interesting name. Mm -hmm. But uh, they actually write over, we're on the hard drive, we say we have to, uh, we just write over whatever we need. Mm -hmm. What this does is it goes out there in those areas and it, either write zeros, ones, a pattern of numbers, or, and it writes, writes it multiple times. You can do it up to the de Department of Defense standards. And what it means is you cannot retrieve that by any normal software means. About the only way you could get any of it back is using an electron microscope on the copper oxide platter. And I, I've never done any of that. That's above my pay grade and it's very expensive but they've been able to get some terrorist data back that way. But once it's wiped software wise, we can't get it back. Well, one of the things that we, with, with this uh, specific Marine, one of the things that we were able to do uh, was, although his, his laptop was useless because the emails that he was sending were still on government servers, we could go back, you know, I think six or seven months yes. and, re and recover all that and use that as evidence. But, uh, I got a question with, for you, sir, regarding the Fourth Amendment and how this stuff kind of works. But before we get there, let's say uh, good morning to a couple of folks jumping on. Abid is on from uh, Round Rock, Texas. Robert is on from Southern Indiana. John Jocks, good morning. Coin number 308. What a great number you got there. Uh, Julie, good morning uh, up in New York City. Uh, please like and share. As you can tell, we got Dr. Stuart Wells on this morning, professor at the Tennessee Technological University. And uh, Dr. Wells, we're talking about forensics. Has the courts kept pace with our Fourth Amendment protections or is there any erosion going on there? The courts are going to have to catch up and that's normal. That, that's not a, a, a criticism of the courts. They, they have to react to what's coming out there. And, and that's where our case law is going to come from on some of this, these things that fill in the, the gaps that, uh, statutory law just doesn't cover and people are learning even at the statutory law level and at the case law level what's going to work and what's not going to work what's going to be legal and what's not going to be legal and computers and the ability to get into computers has caused a myriad of concerns all the way around concerns about the ability to be able to get into uh to find these things and then protection from people coming in and finding these things. So the fourth amendment is really important to us right now. We need to protect that uh, because we put so much of our lives into a computer now that 60 years ago we didn't do. If, oh yeah. Yeah. If you give me, if you give me your computer that you use every day, I'm going to know you better than just about anybody in your family. 
I mean, it's just, that's just the way it is. That's an absolute fact. Uh, good morning. Mr. Rob Pincus is on, sir. Good morning for, uh, for joining us here at coffee with rich Honored to have you, sir. Gerald says using a company computer belongs to them, including all the data. And Gerald works in uh, it, I believe uh, at a university in Oregon. I won't necessarily say which one, but, um, yeah. So one of the issues that, that I've always thought about, if you look at your phone, it's telling you how much screen time you got. And, and this thing is telling me I'm on the phone, you know, uh, watching my phone or some sort of screen time three plus hours a day. Now, of course I use this to work just like most mm -hmm. Americans do. And I think your point is incredibly well taken. The AIs that are, uh, trying to increase engagement on the phone are, know me really well. And like I said, Dr. Wells, if you got to hold that phone, you would, you would equally know me. And that's the concern. And really, honestly, for the viewers out there this morning, the 30 folks that are joining us, that's one of the reasons I want to have Dr. Wells on the phone is because while we are a self-defense podcast, understand that you are walking around in cyberspace, just like you're walking around in the streets and you are at risk and your data is at risk. Um, and it could have some pretty terrible repercussions if you're not protected. Would you agree, sir? Oh, uh, completely. And I go back that I do agree on who owns that data. And if we get a chance, I'd like to go into a, 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 this is probably a real good time. Let me touch that and we'll come back to the rest of what we were talking about. Not only does the data belong to the company and it has a right to protect that data, but also if you connect in most situations, if you connect your personally owned device to it, they then have the right to search your personal device. So if I go to Tennessee Tech and I hook up one of my notebook computers to the Eagle Net, they have a right then if they want to, to come search everything on my computer. And on one side, that's bad because we lose it. We lose some of that uh, protection that we've had, some of that privacy. One of the things we have to remember is the word private does not exist anywhere in the Constitution. It is implied. And so we that makes us have to guard it even more. And that's one of the big things. Uh, just because I log on to Tennessee Tech's computer does not mean I want to share everything I have with them. Uh, probably wouldn't hurt anything, but there are times when it actually could. Uh, I don't ever hook one of my computers that contains any contraband to anything else. However, if I were to have to, for some reason, by law, they could not look at it. But then on the other hand, by law, they can. So that's where the courts haven't kept up. The reason they can't is because if it's contraband, I have a uh, use, protect and destroy order from the court. Uh, so, that will trump their ability to just go take my computer and analyze it, do all the forensics on it. However, they could then go back and get a warrant and look for specific things and would have access. So it's, it's rather blurred there where, where our protections come in. And what was the second, I'm sorry, I forgot. What was the second part of uh, that question other than the, uh, who owned the data? Uh, I think that was, I think you covered it well, Dr. Wells. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Um, Paul says, can you talk uh, specifically about cell phone data? Yes. Now, a lot of cell phone data is stored on the cloud, but it's getting easier and easier to do cloud forensics, which is another area of digital forensics. And even though it's stored on the cloud, we can usually get it back. If we have the credentials, we can get it back just as simple as that. However, without the credentials, cell phones are much harder to, for lack of a better term, break into and get all that data out that maybe somebody didn't want you to get out of it. And we have some, the software, like I said, is getting better and better and better on that, but the phones are getting more and more secure. So the big difference is, do you have the credentials to log into it or not? If you don't, it's very difficult, if not impossible, for most people, most forensics people to get into them because they'll have the, you try it 10 times and it wipes everything out. Well, once it does that, there's nothing there to get back. It's not a, oh, I just set a flag in there and, it, and I'm not going to let you look anymore. No, it's actually gone. Mm -hmm. So we have, to, and a lot of the times we do dictionary attacks to crack passwords. Well, it tries things that uh, my system it's about it tries at about 
400,000 per second different passwords doing dictionary attacks. And that can still take days. But it, it just gets much harder uh, on the cell phones when you can only try 10. Right. So that attack is not going to work. You have to do a, a, probably a social engineering attack mm -hmm. where we find out things about the people. And probably in your job in the Marine Corps, y'all did a lot of social engineering to figure things out and get people to do things they wouldn't have done uh, otherwise. Oh, absolutely. Uh, yeah, that that's a huge part of uh, of uh, of that. Let's see. We got a couple of questions coming in here. Uh, I had a bunch of questions for you, Dr. Wills, but it looks like the audience has taken over that this morning, but that's okay because uh, they're really good questions. This one says, what does Dr. Wells think about Snowden? It's a big question. About Snowden. Ooh. I have, I, I'm going to have to back off on that one. I, I'm going to fail you a little here. I, I don't know enough of the details. I know enough of the things I have heard, but I don't know enough of the facts for me to speak clearly on that right now. I, I know it'd be very easy to jump in and take one side or the other, but uh, I'd prefer not to do that until I know a little more. So I'm, I'm going to flake out on you here a little. I, I'm probably not the best person to answer that one. So yeah, and neither am I, you know, it's funny. I, I don't know enough of the details as to what was released. I, I think uh, as a proxy, I used the Pentagon papers that were released back in the uh, what was it, the late sixties, early seventies. Uh, but really, I think they're apples and oranges in the way they were released and the the amount of information and the type of information. Uh, Jay says, "Good morning from Hawaii." Ted says, "Mississippi, happy to be here." Doctor John Adine says, "Does a VPN protect your data?" Uh, it can. Yes, it can provide you another layer of protection. It also provides another access point to your data. So that's the, the downside to it. So if you're a VPN can help you protect your data. Yes, make sure they do. And that would probably be a whole course in itself or at least a seminar. Uh, but you, you want to know not all VPNs are created equal. Look at the security measures they put in. Uh, what do they require on passwords? What kind of encryption do they do? Uh, how much privacy do they provide you uh, with your IP address? And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to branch back to something here if I can just for a minute. We're talking about the courts. Mm -hmm. And this is a place where it comes in. I would like for the courts, and please don't some judge hear this and think I'm being uh, disrespectful and I'm not at all. But just, a, and I use this as a general topic. IP addresses are not people. IP addresses are just that. They're, they're like a phone number. You know, we, we know where that phone is, but you don't know who's been talking on it. And there's some things in the court system that, in terms of evidence and things like that, that need to be straightened out a little bit to make sure that, that we don't confuse those two. Because I've seen a lot of people get charged criminally because of their IP address. Oh, that's, most, a, that's a great point. I never thought about that. Yeah. And you've got to remember it's all it is, is an address that can be spoofed. Well, speaking so, of the courts, uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Wells, tell us about uh, what, what are your thoughts on the Patriot Act? Are there concerns there? Yes. Uh, I, and here again, all I can talk is in broad terms, but it, it, it gives two, I think it gives two broader powers and I'm always for, uh, I'm on the side of law and order 100%, even though I work for the defense and I'll explain that here in a moment, why uh, I do what I do, but there are things in the Patriot Act that really seem to infringe on what we would assume as Americans are our, our liberties and our, our privacy issues. I, I think, and that's, and it's more a matter of degree in a lot of areas but it's something to be concerned about. Uh, a lot of things in the Patriot Act are good, but there's a lot of things in there that really scare me. Uh, I don't like the idea that they can put a scrubber out there on the internet and it just, it 
checks just about every message that goes anywhere looking for keywords and things. Well, to me that I'm, I'm an old cop too. That's not probable cause, you know, it could be anything. And then they go take a look at you as if they somewhat as if they had probable cause. And that's my biggest concern with it. They, they just, it, it gets overextended. It was yeah. meant for something really good, but it got overextended. Well, again, I think that's the way a lot of the laws are there. Uh, I think they start with good intentions, but then you get a, a loose interpretation of it or it starts out. We're going to, it's just going to be metadata. And then the metadata turns into something else. And yes, John says, what is your nemesis when doing forensics? My nemesis in forensics. Uh, <laughs> my wife says time. Uh, <laughs> That's one of them. And I'll just make this as an aside while I'm kind of organizing my thoughts directly on the question. It takes, it's a hurry up and wait job. In fact, I, I have a couple of my programs that say, would you like me to send you an email when this finishes? So that gives you an idea. You're not going to sit there and drink half a cup of coffee and it spit out the answers. But uh, my biggest nemesis is usually not the suspect. Uh, I don't think what the, the, the biggest nemesis in there is. I would say in the, it'd be in the cell phone area because we don't have near the standardization. It's much more difficult to get in and get information out of a cell phone or a, a tablet than it is off a computer with a hard drive, mm -hmm. just by the very nature of the hardware and software. And now with our, I'll tell you our biggest nemesis, and I, and I, I don't know why I didn't think of it to begin with. It goes right along with this, and that's solid state drives. And we told you before why that's one reason we don't get as much off of them. But many times they're soldered onto the motherboard. <coughs> Therefore, you can't take them out and connect them to a write blocker, which is one of the forensic tools we use to make sure it's admissible in court, and then make a forensic image of it. Now, forensic image is not a... It's not a copy. It's an exact representation bit mm. by bit. And so we get a lot of stuff that you wouldn't get otherwise in there. Wow. But, but uh, the, the hardest part is when you have it soldered in, you can't take it out to get to it. And some of them have full disk encryption, which means there's a, uh, they can do it by software or they can do it with a chip that's on that board. So even if you were to unsolder it, and try to load it, you won't get anything because it's missing that little encoder and decoder chip. So that's some of our bigger things. And, and we've got some ways to address that too. You can make a bootable uh, thumb drive uh, with an imager on it and just don't let it mount the hard drives. Let it see them out there as drives zero, one, and two, not a, uh, C, D, and E because those are logical drives. And then I can make an image of the physical drive without mounting it. If I don't mount it, uh, it never does the trim function, which never selects any of those squares for uh, to be shaken or erased. And it never invokes the uh, garbage collection. Hmm. So there's a way around it, but you can see we're going through more and more things. Otherwise, I take out two screws, slide the drive out. I have a bay I slide it into, hook the cables up, make an image of it. But that's one thing I always do. And you can always tell if somebody's going to do something for you, if they know a little about forensics, they should always use a hardware write blocker. And that just keeps anything from being written to your original evidence. Because when you crank up Windows, it immediately wants to go out and write things. Mm. And I guess the biggest the most valuable single piece of information out there are what we call the Mac dates, Mo the date it was modified, the date it was last accessed and the date it was created. And the interesting thing about that is that tells you so much about what's going on and when it happens, you can build timelines. Uh, you can also show that, Hey, somebody wasn't here when this happened. So what does that mean? And, it gives you just a tremendous amount of, of information out of those. And the funniest thing is, and I got asked this in court once, uh, an attorney said, well, Dr. Wells, I'm looking at your evidence here and it shows that this was modified six months before it was created. You must have some bad data. 
Well, not exactly. The created doesn't mean, and this can help everybody listening because it'll help you in just your daily life on stuff sometimes. Day created doesn't mean the date it came into existence. It means the date it came into existence on that hard drive or that partition or that thumb drive. So if you've modified it this week and you copy it somewhere else next week, wherever it goes to has the old modification date, but has the new created date. Hmm. So those are some little things that, that we run into and have to keep straight. So uh, thank you to the 33 folks that are joining us, 35 now. Uh, thank you, Dr. Wells, for that explanation. And I know we got down in the weeds a little bit, and I appreciate that because that's how we're going to learn today. Please like and share. We got more to come. Uh, Julie was referencing your uh, discussion about the Patriot Act. She says it's unconstitutional in scope. Of course, that, yeah, that's what I agree. Says. I yep. totally agree with you, Julie. Yeah. Um, let's see here, Dr. Wells. I got a question for you. How exposed are most your average Americans to computer fraud? Very. Very exposed. <laughs> very. If I had yeah. answered in one word, very. And I, see, and I see it on my computer every day. I, there's not a day goes by when I don't get from one to three scam attempts. Mm. And you get where you you recognize a lot of them, but some of them are very difficult to recognize. I got one from PayPal the other day. I got another one from Amazon. It wasn't from them, but it sure looked like their logo and everything, but it didn't make sense. Let me give you, I'll, in fact, I'll give your listeners a tip here. And if y'all already know it, please forgive me. But the thing is, uh, if somebody sends you an email that says, uh, you know, log in here. You've just won. Don't do it. And I, I will tell you with 100% accuracy, you haven't won anything, but a chance to get scammed yeah. because that's not the way they're going to notify you. If you've won a prize, they'll yeah. send it by some certified or registered mail. All they're doing is a phishing attempt to try to get your credentials, put them with other things they have. And it's like, uh, I had a guy trying to buy uh, car parts down in San Antonio on my credit card the other day at Rock Auto. And it happens. So you change credit cards again. And we're very careful. Now, that's oh, a place right. where if you can use a VPN, it might help. Yeah, absolutely. And I agree with you. Not all VPNs are created equal. Um, Gerald says, great weeds so far. So I thank you about that. <laughs> I would ask you this, uh, Dr. Wills, you know, are, are, where is, what is the greatest risk? Is it what we're doing on our computers or what we're doing on our cell phone? Is it a combination? Is it through the email? What do you, what do you see there? It, it really depends. It, it's all deep water out there and it, it depends on what you use the most. If I took our family in particular, my wife and my daughter are most vulnerable on their cell phones. I'm most vulnerable on my computer because that's where I do most of my transactions. And so, uh, but both of them, there are any number of ways that they're going to come out and try to scam you one way or the other, get your credentials, uh, spam your phone number. How many, uh, to your listeners out there, I bet a lot of you've got, I know I have get a call from somebody and didn't catch it. So I call them back and they didn't call us. And it's always somebody I know and come to find out it's somebody spamming their or scamming their number and spoofing it at, to get information. And most of it, most of these things are so they can get information. Even if it's as little as finding out, is this a working number? So once you answer it, you've already given them some information. And I had a guy the other night tell me he was going to try to save me on my credit card. There'd been a thing and he called me up and I said, first things I don't use a credit card, use a debit card. He said, Oh, Oh yeah, but we, we've got that too. And he tells me that, the, and would I give him my number? And I went, no, you call me. Don't you know my number? And you could tell very quickly that I would, he hung up after a few questions, but it's out there. It's, and with COVID, I swear people have had more time to be on their phones, more time to be on their computers. And so have the bad guys, the malware people are out there. And there's more mountain, uh, in addition to people scamming you, there's more malware out there that puts trackers on, on your system. I clean trackers off my system every day. Wow. 
I think that'll, and it's like, it's like uh, the spam phone calls. We ought to have to opt into that, not opt out. That's a great way of looking at it. I wish that was the case. Uh, thank you to the 34 folks that are joining us. If you're just joining us live because somebody chose to share this with you. My name is Rich Brown. I'm the co-host, co-founder of the American Warrior Show and the American Warrior Society. And today we're joined by Dr. Stuart Wells, a uh, professor at the Univers uh, University of Tennessee, Tennessee Technological Tennessee Technological University. That's a big word there. I had a question for you, sir. What are the attack surfaces in the cyber realm? And I'm, I, if you could explain maybe threat modeling and attack surfaces and stuff just a little bit to our uh, viewers today. Okay. Attack surfaces is where you look and see where are all the, what creates the surface are these vectors. And I'm not going to try to get down in the grass because I'll get myself lost down there. But seriously, what it does is it, it gives you kind of a two dimensional view of where are your threats coming from. And, and it's, uh, gives you a real good idea of who the adversaries might be. And then on the other side, uh, when we do the threat assessment, what we do there, that's a very risk based, uh, and what we're looking it's very risk based and what we're looking for are vulnerabilities on our side. And when you have vulnerabilities that meet up with uh, these people that, when you, that you've identified in your surface as being potentially harmful, then you, that's where you've got to decide what are we going to do? What's it worth us to us to plug this hole or to plug it to what degree we have to do? And it, it's a it's a tough deal. The the good thing I like about the uh, the way the way we're doing it is it's a very organized plan. It's very organized, logical, and thorough plan for identifying where our threats are, how bad those threats are, and what the likely damage is if that threat succeeds. And that's the only way you can really get a true assessment. You know, if it's going to cost me a hundred thousand uh, dollars. If we have a breach, let's say, and the, the chance of it are 1%, well, my cost on that's $1,000. Overall, it's going to cost me $1,000 somewhere along the way. So we don't want to spend $6,000 plugging that hole. Uh, it may be worth it just to leave it like it is. On the other hand, if that's a make or break deal, and that's a decision that has to be made at, at the upper levels, then we, we put in place whatever we have to. But the two things about those two concepts you're talking about is one looks at what are our weaknesses? Where are our vulnerabilities? Our vulnerabilities can be anything from lack of password enforcement to too weak of passwords, uh, disgruntled employees. I mean, it can just, you know, your usual cyber attacks, it can be just about anything. Uh, if we, we may have some vulnerabilities in our firewalls that we know about. We've got to find out what all those are. And you can only find them out if you do a very logical, structured approach to it. Then on the other side is, okay, we've got these vulnerabilities. Do we have anybody that it looks like or threats on that surface, any vectors of attack that may hit one of our vulnerabilities? And that's where we're matching up and why those two things work well together. All right. Thank you, sir. Got some questions coming in. Let's see here. Donald says, I get those uh, folks from Nigeria saying they're from the IRS. Yeah. Uh, oh, yeah. My good, yeah. My good friend, Michael Gentile says, what security software do you recommend for home computing? Uh, Norton's good. I use McAfee and I really don't have a choice of one over the other in particular. Both of them have done a really, really good job. And uh, I also use malware bytes. So I use three. Malware bytes is a little bit different from the others, and it catches some things that, that the others I've found haven't caught. So I really like that one. I'm taking notes. Uh, my brother Jeff says, what are some threats we can look out for with regard to international travel, uh, specifically Wi-Fi accounts, et cetera? Well, I can only surmise on that. I am, I have not done that. I'm not an expert in that, but just for, uh, surmising what the problems might be. Other companies have other countries in general have much less security over their networks than we do. And we don't have enough. 
So I would be very, very careful of anything that I sent out. But then on the other hand, you say, well, I'll just stay at home and be safe. Well, you're international the minute you get on the Internet. Mm-hmm. We don't know who we're talking to. They could be across town. They could be across the world. That's, so, a, that's a great way of thinking. I mean, about it, it, yeah. it's not as it's, it's it's not as big a deal as I could make it, but you're you're doing international anyway. Anytime you do a transaction, I did a transaction the other day. Uh, oh, what's the? I just drew a blank. Uh, it's on the it's uh, it's a software uh, quick target and quick load, and those came from England or England or Germany, I can't remember which, but I remember it was European. And I thought, okay, I've just exposed all my credit cards to Europe now. Yeah, exactly. And and I, and I never left Putnam County. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Duh, this is great. And again, if you're watching this morning and you're going, what is uh, you know, this self-defense show doing talking about the cyber realm? And I will tell you, uh, a lot of our lives today is a or in this case, international viewers as well, are spent in this world right here. And if we're not protecting ourselves there, we're uh, vulnerable to an attack. And it can be just as devastating as getting mugged in in an alleyway. So Dr. John Adine says, what characteristics should we be looking for at a good VPN? Uh, Make sure that they, again, I'm going to give you a broad answer. This may not satisfy it, but my number one thing is I want security, Number one, I want to make sure that if I'm going to put something out on a VPN, particularly a lot of the stuff I do, which is casework, I want to make sure it's secure. Uh, I want to know what kind of firewalls that they're using to make sure that they've got good things in place. And it's not so much which firewall is, are they using a good firewall? Uh, Sometimes you'd think people would, and they're not. So you want that, you want encryption, uh, And I want a company that's going to be reliable. Uh, One thing about it, when we put something on the cloud, all we're doing is putting it on somebody else's computer. And when you use that virtual private network, you're just using somebody else's hardware. And it's set up in a particular way for us, obviously. But we've still got to be careful. Some of my friends and I, we use uh, something called Wire. Dr. Wells, I'm not sure if you're familiar with it, but it's a... it's a messaging app. It's end-to-end encrypted. It's uh, everything that they do sits on a Swiss server. I mean, how far do we need to be worried about this thing? I'd say you're very secure with that. Relative okay. to everybody else, you're very, you should be very secure on that. I, I would feel comfortable anyway. Uh, the best thing is you do some research before you go with a VPN. You'll find out very quickly on the Internet. I wouldn't listen. I wouldn't read two articles and make my decision. But after you've read enough articles, you'll get a pretty good picture of ever, how people do business out there. Well, and that you, you bring up a great point uh, with regard to business. And I've heard it said, Dr. Wells, and you can tell me if we're on target or not, that if you're not paying for the product, you are the product. So one of the things that I've heard is with a VPN, make sure that it's something you're paying for. There are free VPNs out there. And I got to worry about, are they, trying to scrub my data and then re-monetize it. Uh, what do you think about that? That's where you have to read those endless EULAs in user <laughs> license agreements. And they are long and difficult. My wife has a law degree, so I let her read those and tell me what I need to know and what I'm to think about it. <laughs> Sounds yeah. like what one of the political parties wants to do to us, but that's a well, that's another story for another day. Yes, it is. Julie says, great show. Thank you. John King says, so much helpful information. Thank you, guys. Uh, Well, Andrew Branca is on this morning from the Law of Self-Defense. Good morning, Andrew. Happy to have you, sir. Ruben asks, uh, Dr. Wells, do you recommend Apple or Android? And if so, why? I use Android. Uh, I think the Apple are more secure. I Mm. just... I just personally like the Android app better and I try not to do for me personally, I try not to do that much that is super secure. You know, that, that really needs that high level on a phone. Uh, now the Apple, <clears throat> Apple seems to kind of lead the way in security. So right now, uh, if I were worried about security, I would probably go with Apple. 
Okay. And uh, that goes into the next question. Um, Andrew Branca, who wrote the law of self-defense, uh, probably the leading American attorney in self-defense law, says Apple versus Windows in context of viruses or hacking vulnerability. Would you, is that recommendation still stand? Uh, yeah. It does. Uh, Apple still has a lot less vulnerabilities and has a lot less people attacking it than Windows does. Windows has been around longer. They ha the hackers have had more time. The nefarious people have had more time to look at it and work with it. And it's been more open code than Apple has. Apple's been a very closed box, uh, closed software as much as they could. It's becoming more, so more open, but still, I would say you're going to have less attacks with the Apple. Michael asks, do you have any thoughts on RFID capture from personal cards or devices? Is that a threat? Yes, it's a threat. I don't know a lot about it. I just know that they, they do make scanners that can read your cards and you can, you can either, and I'm not recommending that we all wear the, uh, the tinfoil helmets, but, uh, you know, they make wallets that will help prevent that, that have uh, some metal in them. Yes, they do. Um, Andrew says, do you recommend the use of prepaid cards in lieu of credit cards in order to uh, reduce or eliminate your exposure? That is certainly a good way to go. And I tell you, I, and I'm not plugging anybody. I use PayPal for a lot of things and I just tie it to an account. And by the time PayPal clears it and the bank clears it, I've had two or three people try to scam me, but they've always caught it. So I felt pretty good about that, doing it that way. But yes, prepaid is, is a good, straightforward way to do it. And you mentioned something just a minute ago, if you don't mind me going back to it, you're talking about the security and personal defense. They tie hand in hand. If they get the information out of your cell phone, they know where you live. Mm -hmm. They know how to call you. They, and if they want to get sophisticated enough, there's ways to get you tracked, but it's not easy, but it's possible. And that's why, I, and if they know things like that, it's even but even more important to be aware in your self-defense. It's not just uh, who's sneaking around the corner, but who has my information and knows where I live. And once you get one piece of information, I did some private investigation work. Once you get one little piece of information, it rapidly leads to everything else you want to know. Uh, yes, sir. And that's a good segue uh, to talk about, you know, in this current divisive climate uh, that we're experiencing here in America in 2020, mm -hmm. there seems to be a real market for cyber cybersecurity, both at the micro and macro level. Where does someone even begin, Dr. Wills? That's a tough one. Uh, here again, I'm a big constitutionalist and I believe in, in freedom of speech. We've just got to be careful that... Uh, what we're speaking, we think we're speaking that our stuff doesn't get corrupted or translated differently. Uh, we've got to be careful that other people don't get, get our ideas before they're published. Uh, you've got to be careful of people kind of anticipating your moves. If they can get into your, uh, data network, whether it be via phone or via computer, they're always a step ahead of you. And as devices of things are, we've already seen that people don't seem to have the integrity as a, in general, there's a lot of lack of integrity among some people. Let me put it that way. And they will do whatever they can to get ahead. And we have that problem. It exists even at the micro level, uh, because it does not take somebody with a PhD in this to figure out, you know, how to, uh, spoof somebody's phone, how to get information, how to fish. It's just really not that difficult. We just did one out of, uh, New York recently. It was a cyber, uh, it was an incident. Turned out it had a healthcare information, turned out not to be a breach, but it was breached through, uh, one of their executives phones. And then from the phone into the, uh, their computer system. So it was an incident. It did not reach the breach level. We were able to prove that it, nobody got to their data by looking at the metadata that went with it, but still not easy. 
Uh, there's been some uh, huge hacks. I think it was uh, Yahoo, I believe it was, that uh, has been breached multiple times. And, you know, there's no telling what kind of user data was collected when uh, they breach Yahoo. They get all the passwords yeah. that have been used. And does that mean that they get access to the emails as well or no? Well, it depends. Just depends on, totally depends on how much information they got and how deep their hack went. They could get everything. Uh, sometimes they get it and sometimes they don't, which kind of leads us up to the ransomware deal. Uh, we're all subject to ransomware where uh, it gets, it happens to cities, towns, law enforcement agencies. Uh, I personally know of all of these that have happened. Uh, and sometimes they get their data back and sometimes they don't. So, and in fact, one of the, the breaches came through, uh, a computer system at one of the organizations. And it's so easy because if they find one place, they're like mice. If they find one place to get in, once they're in, they run wild. Mm -hmm. So once they break through that firewall and, and get through your security, they're in your warehouse. Yeah, I have a friend who uh, works for a large metropolitan police agency here in the United States. And just a couple of weeks ago, we were on the range and he said uh, that their police department was being held hostage, I think, for four, to the tune of like four hundred thousand mm -hmm. dollars. And uh, th that's scary when you can have a large metropolitan police agency that's being ransomed like that. Wow. I'll we'll tell you a funny story right quick, if you don't mind. Please. Uh, one of the attorneys that I work with frequently gave me a call and said, somebody's hacked my, hacked our email and they're wanting ransomware, $3,000 in Bitcoin. So that it couldn't be traced or they're going to turn all our, they're going to publish all of our law firm files. And they said, what do we do? I said, well, I wouldn't pay it. Two reasons. One, you encourage them to do it again. And number two, there's no guarantee they're going to give you anything back anyway. And number two you, or three, you don't even know that they have anything. I said, let me take a look at it. Well, it only took about 15 minutes. You can look back through the headers on emails. And I traced it back to a dorm room at UT Chattanooga. I don't guess I was supposed to say that, but <laughs> every school can have it. I'm not dogging them. Yeah. But I, I, could, I knew which end of the dorm this guy was in. Wow. And so some of them are very sophisticated. Some of them know just enough to go to jail. Yeah. And John Jocks brings up a good point, which is kind of tying in here, Dr. Wells. And that is that many criminals can use social engineering. They don't even really need your computer or your phone, just access to your social media. Exactly. Social media is probably one of the biggest leaks we have and we're all guilty of it. I'm guilty of it. And one of the things that my wife and I talk about anytime we go on vacation, what do you want to do? You want to post vacation pics? Oh my gosh. Why don't we, uh, it's like a shopping mark then for the criminals. Uh, let's say, Oh, Dr. Wells is gone. Well, let's go by his house. I think he's got an old 12 foot John boat that I'd like to have. Mm -hmm. And so we try not to do that or post the pictures after we get back. <coughs> mm -hmm. I've heard that's a really good strategy. Um, you know, another thing is I had a friend of ours, this has been few, several years ago and she was just livid that somebody had gotten pictures of her children and, uh, you know, she said, how could they possibly do that? I'm like, well, you've posted all those pictures on social media. Like, yeah, but those are my pictures. I'm like, once you put them out there, they belong to the world. I have to, I have to teach, I teach my classes that, that, uh, if you put it on the internet, it's there forever mm -hmm. and you're never getting it back. No matter what you want to do, no matter how much money you spend, you will not get it all back. Now you've lost control of that uh, indefinitely. And with regard to, you know, social media, I had a great question, Dr. Wells. I'm about to come back to it. I'm having a senior moment this morning, but I, I do want to ask you this shifting gears with all the unrest and divisiveness at the moment. You know, what are your thoughts about what's going on right now? And, and Okay. Well, I, I'm obviously very concerned about it. I've never seen us this divisive. Uh, I think the last time we were this divisive was about uh, 1861. Mm -hmm. And I hate that. Uh, I, my personal feeling is, is people get along, our leaders don't. Uh, 
I mean, I work at Tennessee Tech. Race is not an issue there. Uh, it looks like the UN and our offices. Uh, I don't mind a peaceful protest if that brings to light an injustice that gives people a way to, you know, express their opinions, let off some of the frustrations. All I am totally against the riots, the looting. That has nothing to do uh, with getting your message out that somebody's being. We'll use the term discriminated against or whatever. Uh, I don't like any of that, but I certainly don't like the looting and rioting. I think that's when it goes goes the wrong way. And a lot of social media fuels that, or news fuels that. And a lot of people have no purpose in life if we all get along. Hmm. And that bothers me. That's an excellent point. Uh, there's nothing to sell if we're all getting along, right? That's it. Um, yeah. Have you seen The Social Dilemma, that documentary, Dr. Wells? I have not. I intend to, but I have not seen it yet. Yeah, it's a really interesting uh, thing. And we've talked about it, or I've, I've thought about it a lot. You know, you mentioned that we haven't really been this divisive since 1861. And most Americans don't know their history as well as they should. As a matter of fact, I've, I have found that most people overseas know more about American history than, than the average American does. <clears throat> and most people are always shocked when I remind them that you know, John Breckinridge, who was uh, President Buchanan's vice president. So he had ran against Lincoln. And uh, of course, Lincoln won. Well, John Breckinridge, the former vice president of these states united, went and became a, a general in the Con Confederate States uh, Army and then later their secretary of defense. So it, it's just amazing to me uh, that that could have happened. And, and I tell you right now, with what's going on in this contested election. And I just don't know how we come back from where we are now. And I hope I'm wrong in that. Well, you and I have similar feelings on that. I, I worry, I don't worry so much for me and my generation is I worry for the, for my daughter's generation and her kids generation and so on. We got a lot of great kids coming up and they deserve a better world than what we're leaving them. And the thing that, that I see over and over again, Politicians can't get along. Leaders can't get along. But when you put the people together, it's great. Yeah. I'll, I'll give you a thing, and and I, I, I'm I'm not a racist, and I, I hope I'm never called one. This summer, I had a heart attack on the golf course, and two football players got me. But there are friends of mine that are students got me to the hospital in 12 minutes and no damage to my heart. And one of those boys uh, happened to be black. And I think one of the things that kept me going is I'm laying over there in the passenger seat, trying not to die. And, and he's, he's driving, trying to get me to the hospital and he'd put his hand over on me and say, doc. And I go, yeah. He says, I love you, brother. Don't you die on me. Hmm. I love you, brother. Don't you die on me. And that's the way people ought to be. It wasn't any black versus white, white versus black. We were just people try, trying to keep my butt alive. <laughs> yeah. And, and same here, you know, Dr. Wells, at 23 years in the Marine Corps, I served with some amazing Americans that were black, Jewish, Asian. Uh, mm -hmm. it was, and it was a beautiful meritocracy in the Marine Corps, well, in the military specifically, where there was no race. Uh, yes. And I really didn't know that the shape that the country was in until I got out of the Marine Corps. And I went, oh, wow, you know, you people are, are having these problems. We didn't have them there because, you know, we're, we're fighting for each other and taking care of one another. And I think there's a lesson there for all Americans, really. Yeah, I think so. And it's so easy and it feels so much better when you get along with people than when you don't. Yeah. And every, every day, if, if I could tell people what, give one people one piece of advice. And as you get old, you start to give two old set of bad example. You start giving good advice, but, uh, you're happier when you make other people happy and you get so much more out of it. I go through life every day. Happy. I look for the good things in life because there's good things going to happen to you every day. And there's bad things going to happen to you every day. Look at the good ones. Let the bad ones pass on by. 
Yeah. It sure makes life better. And and that's whether it's in terms of security or anything else. We're going to have to take responsibility for our own security. There are going to be measures put in place, but every time there are, there's also an equally bright group that's figuring out a way around them. The biggest stop to it is us. That's exactly right. And, uh, you know, I've traveled a lot this year, both for work and for, uh, uh, for vacation and pleasure during the COVID uh, pandemic. And if you watch the news, every city's on fire, you know, you're getting attacked for any number of reasons. And what I found was the opposite. I've had no issues at all with, with folks from all walks of life. So I think a lot of the stuff we see on the media are these isolated incidents that get played on an endless repeat cycle. And it makes us think that this kind of stuff is going on everywhere at all times. Well, I was a little afraid to say that because I figured I might be wrong. But since you've broached the subject, I don't think we're in, bad, in as bad a shape as what it looks like for the very reasons you mentioned. I mean, there's too many people that get along too well. Or maybe we live in a, a bubble here, but if we do, I like our bubble. Yeah, yeah that's, that's well said. You know, um, well, I think that's probably a good place to end it there, Dr. Wells, because we're ending on a very positive note, and I really like that. Uh, any final comments uh, for the viewers out there? Well, uh, I, I guess I'd say I hope everybody has an absolutely fantastic day. The best I could wish on anybody is that y'all all be as happy as my wife and I are. And pulling a plug for, ten, uh, for Tennessee Tech, wings up. <laughs> all right. I love it, Dr. Wells. <clears throat> absolutely. I, I, I want to thank you so much for giving me this opportunity also. Well, thank you for coming on, sir. It's been an absolute pleasure. Where can folks find you if they needed your services? Where do they need to go? Okay. They can use this number 24 seven. Uh, well, let me, I tell you the email will be the easiest to make sure you catch me. It's doc D O C at my M Y C F I as in Charlie Foxtrot Ida dot C O not C O M dot C O. And I've put some links to your website and your faculty page uh, at the university. It's in Thank the you. today's show notes. If you're, if your folks are interested, I would be happy to talk to anybody. Uh, uh, that's what I do for a living as I talk. In well, fact, I'll, need- I'll, I'll leave you, I'll leave you with the funny one. I almost got to stay a long time uh, down at Fort hood in a military trial down there because I didn't stop talking quick enough when the judge or when somebody objected and the judge looked at me and said, Dr. Wells, we will not pontificate in my court. And I said, that's what I do for a living. They have no sense of humor. No, they don't. <laughs> yes, but that. I like to stay with him for a while. I declined the offer. Yeah, we can talk about some of those military court <laughs> things uh, offline. I got some funny stories as well, Dr. Wells. Um, John says, from a fellow digital forensics expert, great show. So thank you, John. I'm, thank you. Uh, Honored to have you and appreciate you. Appreciate that comment. And Dr. Wells, I'll be getting with you on where to go hog hunting. I'm very excited about that. Yeah, let's do it. I tell you, it's it's fun. I'm looking forward to it. I love hunting. It'll hunt hunt you back just a little. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. That's what I like about it. Okay, folks, thank you for being on today's show. A special thank you to Dr. Stuart Wells for being our guest today. And remember, folks, the fight is coming. Be ready.